their class. We are on section 8.5, least squares regression. This is the last chapter of chapter 8. Um, this is basically our application portion of our projections and orthogonality and um, diagonalization of symmetric matrices, although we're mainly focused on the uh, the projection portion in this in this portion. Okay. Um, so least squares regression is used a lot in statistics. Um, you've probably seen it in your other algebra classes when you do, um, it's basically fitting a function to a set of data. Okay. Um, so like if you have a set of data that kind of sort of falls in a line, you would use a least squares linear regression to find the line of best fit, right? If you have, if your data is pretty much U-shaped, you would try to find a parabola that fit or um, a cubic that fit or an exponential function that fit or a logarithm that fit, right? So you're just trying to find the equation that models your your set of data the best, right? Because generally data is collected randomly, so the values don't fit perfectly to any one model. So you try to find the best model you can. So that's kind of what we're going at here. The process is actually rather easy. Um, for what we have to do, you, just, you definitely will need some technology. Um, obviously, you have your calculators, but if you have like um, a solid uh, computer algebra system, that would be nice too. A MATLAB, a, a new Octave, one of those uh, um, computer algebra systems that I put in the resource section in our Canvas page for those of you who are my students that are watching this. Um, so let's go ahead and just go forward, right? When we're analyzing data, so again, I'm just going to rehash what I just said because we, we have our write-up so it's nice to have this in writing right so when we're analyzing our data it's more likely than not that our data needs to be approximated by a function than lying exactly on a line okay so when I come up with a linear model I can do so um, when I'm given some information but if I have a lot of information it's probably not going to line up exactly with what I needed to line up with right especially when I'm collecting data so least squares regression allows us to find a function of best fit that will help us to analyze our data because then we can model it. We can talk about future um, values and extrapolation or intermediary values that it should take on, which is interpolation, right? Um, so let's say that we have A times X equals Y. So again, A is some sort of a, a matrix, transformation matrix, you could call it if you wanted to, times R vector X will give us an output vector of y, right? So whether you're looking at this as a linear transformation or just a matrix equation where A represents a bunch of equations, um, we can form an approximate solution that we call y hat, okay? So if this would be an ideal situation where we had exact solutions, but exact solutions don't exist because our data are all over the place, we can come up with our best approximate solution, which is the y hat value. Okay, so y is basically the same thing here as y. It's just that this doesn't have a solution. So this is the best solution that we can have, which is the y hat, right? Ideally, we would want y hat to be as close as possible to what we would hope for a real solution to be, even though it doesn't exist, right? So in other words, we want to minimize the following function. I want the distance between my y here, which is the ideal solution, and my approximate solution to be minimized, right? So what does this look like? I'm basically subtracting the components between them and squaring it because that's the definition of the norm squared, right? You're basically just taking rid, your, this square portion of the norm squared gets rid of the square root, right? So this is the distance between y and y hat my real solution and the approximate solution. Okay, so I'm just subtracting their components piecewise and squaring them and then adding those values together. If you ever took in a statistics course, this comes up very, very often in statistics. Um, this little thing here, it, this would be a smaller part of a larger portion of a equation for like what's called standard deviation, um, mean, things like that, right? So uh, here's our theorem, okay? let y be a vector and s be a subspace then the vector closest to y in s is given by y hat 
Now y hat is the projection of y onto s. Okay, so the projection of y onto s. So here, s is the column space of a, right? So it's just the space that's generated by, in this case, the column vectors of my matrix. Okay, so let's look something like this. These are all my actual data values, this x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3. It doesn't fall on an exact line, okay? Although it does look like it's decreasing here. Let's say that my line of best fit is this line, okay? Because maybe there's other values here that are not being mentioned. So here I'm going to project each point onto my approximation line, this y hat, right? So now each point on here consists of what happens when I plug in x1 and get out y hat. That is this point, the projected point from my actual data value being projected down onto my approximation line. Okay, so this is the projected value. This is the value that's um, been projected onto the line from the actual data value, right? And this is a collection of those points. Right, so that's my y hat, and that's how it relates to what the ideal value of y1, y2, and y3 should be. It is a projection onto this equation of those points. I hope that makes sense to you guys. Okay, so definition right, if A is an n by m row matrix and y is an n dimensional vector with row values, then a least squares solution. To the equation ax equals y is a vector x hat right and x hat will be of dimension m it, it satisfies uh, this condition okay that the distance between a times x minus y is less than or equal to ax minus y for the actual solution okay so this x hat is our approximation of input values here, right? So this is actually, this x hat is what gives me the values for this equation that I'm gonna find here for this y hat, right? Um, and this is true for every x inside of Rm, okay? So theorem, the set of least square solutions to ax equals y is equal to the set of solutions to the system a transpose ax equals a transpose y. So really what I'm doing is I'm just taking this equation here and I'm multiplying it on the left side by a transpose on both sides of the equal sign. Okay, that's the easiest way to think about it. This is just ax equals y and I'm multiplying it on the left by a transpose. Okay, we call this the normal equations for ax equals y. So what this does here, a transpose a, will be a symmetric matrix, okay? This now gives me a symmetric matrix times x, and that allows me to find um, a transpose times y, and I can find the solution for this, which will be the a, I'm sorry, the uh, x hat, okay? So if a has linearly independent columns, then there is a unique least squares solution given by x hat equals a transpose a inverse times a t y. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm taking this a x equals y, I'm multiplying on the left side by a transpose, and then if I solve this, it will give me not x, but x hat. So what I'm doing is I'm just taking a transpose a, and I'm multiplying it on the left hand side by its inverse, and what that does is it gets rid of this, and it turns it not into x, but x hat, and then I'm Anything you do to one side of the equal sign, you got to do to the other. So I'm multiplying this on the left side by a transpose a inverse as well. So that gives me my approximate solution x hat here of a transpose a inverse, that was from getting rid of this, times what was already there on the uh, right hand side of my equation. Okay, so again, you take this, multiply it on the left side on both sides of the equation by a transpose, then you solve for x by taking the inverse of a transpose a, and that gives you your approximation. So you don't have to do that from scratch every time. We've already done it. This is what your solution will look like. You only have to compute these things. You find a, you find a transpose, you take the inverse, you plug it all in here. So really you just need a, 
right? You can just plug all this stuff into your calculator and get out your least squares solution, right? So this will give you your coefficients basically for your, oops, let's come back here, for your equation that you need here, okay? So I don't know why it says C naught equals, this should be C naught plus C one X. It'll give you basically this C naught and C one values, right? Here we're just calling them X, okay? So otherwise, meaning that if your A does not have linearly independent columns, you will have infinitely many least squares solutions, okay? So let's do an example. We're only doing one example. So these last couple of videos have been rather short. So this is a really short video. Um, we'll go through this one example. Um, every single problem works the exact same way in this section, right? So I don't need to do multiple examples because they're all the same, right? So um, we'll go ahead and go through this right now. All right. So measurements of CO2 in the atmosphere have been taken regularly over the last 50 years at the Mauna Loa Observa Observatory in Hawaii. In addition to a general upward trend, the CO2 data ha also has an annual cyclic behavior. The table below has the monthly me measurements in parts per million for 2009. Okay, so this is the corresponding month, January through uh, December. And then these are the CO2 levels, the carbon dioxide in parts per million. Okay, parts per million. We want to find constants A, B, and C such that the model given here. So we need our model to look like this. Basically a linear function plus a cyclic um, sinusoidal function uh, with the given period here, right? Best fits the data where T is time in months. Use your model to predict the CO2 levels in January 2002 right so again here this pi over 6 if you were to um, divide this by uh, 2 pi or I guess it's the opposite way 2 pi divided by this it'll give you 12 because that's what the period is right so this term right here gives us a period of 12 months so that it's um, cyclic in the annual sense right so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these okay these are my inputs. These are my outputs. When I plug in one here, I'm going to get out 386.92. Okay. So one is the time. The time is in months, right? T is time in months. So I'm going to plug in one. I'll get A plus B plus C sine pi over six equals 386.92. And I'm going to do that for one through 12. And as I do that, I should develop a matrix. That matrix that I'll develop by plugging in the inputs and having an output out, which I can't solve for, will give me my matrix A. That will be my, my matrix equation that does not have a solution, right? My X's in this case are the 12 months, right? The 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 through 12 that I'm plugging into. That'll give me a function here, right? Um, and then Y will be that list of outputs that I have, right? So that's what I need to do. So when I do that, okay, I get this matrix. So I'll let you do that on the side. You should get the same thing. So this corresponds to A because A is never being multiplied by anything. It's always just A. There's always one A there. However, B, there's one B, two Bs, three Bs, four Bs, five Bs, six Bs, etc. right? So this stays as one because it's always just one A. Here there's one B, two B, three B, four B, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then here we're getting this from, sorry, from this portion for the C's, right? So when I plug in one, I have sine of pi over six. So what's pi over six? Pi over six is one half. So I have one half C, right? When I plug in two, I got pi over three. Pi over three is root three over two, right? So here I'm just basically going through, um, basically through the unit circle at a rate of pi over six. So pi sine of pi over six, sine of pi over three, sine of uh, three pi over six, which is pi over two, right? Or the 90 degrees. So 
30, 60, 90, and then we're going down um, on the other side, right? So one, uh, what's that? 120, 150, 180, right? And then so forth through the bottom half of the unit circle. So we're just going by basically 30 degrees at a time, right? Um, and that's why we got the 12. So that's how I make my matrix A, okay? So let's just come back to what I need. So now that I have A, really, I'm just going to follow this formula, okay? I'm going to take A transpose. I'm going to multiply it times my A. I'm going to find the inverse of that and multiply that times A transpose, okay? Before we do that, however, let's just flesh out this matrix equation just so that we're very thorough. But once I have A, I have enough information to find this X hat value. So, of course, this is ABC, right? Those coefficients that I'm trying to solve for so that I know exactly, sorry, what coefficient, coefficients I need here to make this the function of best fit. And here my Y is all of those outputs that I had, right? So this is one equation all the way down to this last equation, okay? So X uh, hat here is just this formula. And you just do it in the exact same order, okay? Find this, find the inverse, and then take that value and multiply it times this. Just make sure if it's on the right side, it needs to be on the right side. If something's on the left side, it has to be on the left side. It's it's when you start mixing the order up that you're going to get confused. So just make sure everything is on the correct side. Um, when you plug this all in, this is the value you're going to get, okay? My A is going to be 386.9501. 67736 my B will be this value and the C that I had will be this value okay I, I shouldn't have to show you how to plug this in it should be pretty straightforward just a word of advice find an, a transpose a first take the inverse of that then after you have that resulting matrix take that inverse matrix you just found and multiply it times a transpose just make sure they're on the right side of the equation that you need them to be and this gives us a function of best fit as my A plus BT plus C sine pi over 6T. So again here, it's highly likely you're going to have to find um, decimal approximations. However many decimals you want to keep is fine. I suggest four or more. Do not do less than four unless it tells you to do less than four. However, there is kind of a standard um, rule. And that is, if you are given two decimal value places, then your answer should have three decimal places, okay? Um, I always just say go with four, okay? Four is good. Unless they give you four, then you want to provide five, right? But the standard sort of rule for that is, if you're given two, you provide one extra decimal place. I always just do four. It's the safest bet, okay? For those of you who are engineers and physicists, at this point, you should be comfortable with um the number of significant digits you should be leaving. Right? And that's it for linear regression. Thanks, guys.